Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of V Brown Bag. A very special edition tonight because today we've got we've got two um, people on that I'm very happy to have. We've got G Gene Kim, obviously, the uh, the writer of the Phoenix Project and the DevOps Handbook, and we've also got oh, click myself and Rebecca Fitzhugh, a brand new host to the V Brown Bag team and VCDX number 243. Um, this is V Brown Bag. Um, Rebecca and I will be watching uh, the Twitter, V Brown Bag hashtag, to field your questions for you tonight. Um, we've also got our end of the year giveaways that we've um, that we've been asking our sponsors to, to pony up for. So we've got a bunch of really cool, fun things uh, to give away. Make sure that you go to the website, look for the giveaway, sign up for them. Rebecca and I can, obviously. So um, more for you guys. And uh, also, we've um, Fraps is running with Commitmas right now, obviously. The, the 12 days of Commitmas, learn all about the GitHubs, learn how to commit, learn about your repositories, um, catch up with all of the episodes from last year as well, because there's a lot of really good stuff there. Um, and so with that, we have, huzzah, Gene Kim here. Um, here Chris, so happy to be here, and Rebecca as well. And again, congratulations on the VCDX. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, yeah, well, we, uh, Chris and I, we ran into each other in Barcelona, and I was uh, delighted and jumped at the opportunity to uh, be on the show. So I, what I want to do in just 15 minutes is share with you some of the top lessons learned uh, that came, that uh, I uh, some of my top learnings since the Phoenix Page project came out in 2013, um, and it is almost impossible to overstate you know just how much I learned. In fact, these are all things that I wish I had learned you know before the Phoenix project came out. Um, on the next slide, Chris, uh, you know the uh, some many people will joke about this still with me, uh, but the DevOps handbook is finally here. Uh, I guess the reason why they joke about it is that it was five and a half years in the making. Um, you know, it was actually supposed to come out uh, before the Phoenix project, but uh, it was so clear to uh, at least me uh, that you know I did I personally didn't know enough uh, you know to actually finish the book um, you know, in 2013, and so the Phoenix project came out first, and uh, three years later the DevOps handbook is finally here. Uh, the thing one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that it does have 48 case studies in it. Uh, a lot of it came out of the DevOps Enterprise Summit conference uh, that I run, so uh, a lot of those learnings uh, made it uh, into here. Uh, so I guess the first uh, huge learning. Uh, is on the next slide is just to what extent uh, the business value that's created with DevOps principles and patterns uh, it's even higher than we thought. Um, I've had the privilege of working with uh, a gentleman named Jez Humble. Uh, he's the author of the Continuous Delivery book, uh, co-author rather, and he's a, a friend and co-author of the DevOps Handbook. And uh, over the last four years, we worked with Nicole Forsgren, uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, and uh, Puppet, and uh, we benchmarked 22,000 organizations, and we found that high performers are massively outperforming their non-high performing peers. So I'll just flash uh, these metrics at you and it's just uh, uh, so you can wield them to advance your own missions. So uh, we found that high performers uh, are significantly more agile, have significantly higher throughput. Uh, they are doing 200 times more frequent deployments, and so that could be deployments of code uh, by development or it could be changes uh, to the environment by you know, development, ops, test, etc. And more importantly, they can complete those changes 2,500 times more quickly. In other words, how quick, quickly can we go from a change introduced into version control uh, through some sort of test process, through some sort of uh, deployment process, and be, actually be running successfully in production? High performers will do this in minutes or hours, whereas with lower performers, it might take them weeks, months, or quarters. Um, and, and so I think that's been, uh, you know, I think our common experience for, you know, uh, decades. Uh, the next uh, slide shows, I, I guess, uh, a decisive finding that's come up over four years is that not only are high performers getting more done, but they have significantly better outcomes. When they do a production deployment, uh, they're uh, uh, one-third as likely, uh, the high performers are one-third as less likely to result in a 7-1 outage, a service impairment, a security breach, a compliance failure. And when something bad does happen, uh, they can fix issues 24 times more quickly. In other words, the mean time to store service is 24 times faster. And so what I love about this finding is that it validates so much of our common experience um, in that, you know, in general, the larger the size of our deployments, the, the bigger the batch of the changes we're trying to put in, and the longer we've been queuing them up, 
uh, the bigger the crater we make and the longer it takes to actually fill in that crater. So the only way to get these sort of amazing reliability profiles is to do smaller deployments more frequently. Um, so the notion that in manufacturing we call that single piece flow. So on the next slide uh, we found uh, something amazing this year which is another dimension of quality. We found that uh, high performers because they are integrating information security objectives into every stage of everyone's daily work whether it's dev, test, ops, infosec. Um, we spend one half as much time remediating security issues and because uh, high performers do such a better job in controlling unplanned work they're spending a third more time uh, doing planned work on new strategic work versus, you know, the far lower value firefighting, which is necessary, right, uh, to keep things running, but, uh, you know, uh, far, those calories are far better deployed on strategic activities like, you know, modernizing the environment and automating the infrastructure and, you know, helping make developers more productive. On the next slide, um, is something that we found two years ago uh, and has been revalidated year over year is that high performers not ha only have better IT performance as measured by deployment frequency, lead time, change success rate, mean time repair, security, uh, planned work. Uh, they have better organizational performance as well. They're twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. And uh, for those nearly 1,000 organizations that gave us a stock ticker symbol, uh, we found that high performers had 50% higher market cap growth over three years. So, you know, uh, you know, the business value is even higher than we thought. Um, let's go on to the next uh, surprise, um, which is number two, is that DevOps is as good for operations uh, on the next slide as it is for development. It's, uh, in fact, uh, let me just share with you, I guess, two of my favorite quotes. On the next slide, uh, this is a quote from my friend Nathan Shimek. Uh, he told me at a, uh, actually at a bar, um, after the conference that Jez Humble held at uh, Flowcon in San Francisco, uh, he, he said something that actually just made me tear up. He said, as a lifelong ops practitioner, I know that we need DevOps to make our work humane. In the course of my career, I've worked on every holiday, on my birthday, uh, worse yet, on my spouse's birthday, and even on the day my son was born. So, yeah, I think uh, wow. for so many of us in operations, right, that's been a part of our common experience. And, uh, you know, I think we have friends who have done similar things out of the sense of duty or obligation or maybe simply there was no choice. But uh, I, I think what makes this, uh, you know, hit home for me is that, um, you know, many of us have been complicit in creating those very inhumane work systems, right, have, that have forced people to do this. So, you know, I, I think there's a, yeah, this, um, I think really shows the um, a very personal aspect of why DevOps is so important. It doesn't have to be uh, this way. Um, what I find very funny uh, is that there's kind of, kind of this odd symmetry. So uh, the next slide shows a quote from uh, Tim Tischler. Uh, for many years, he led the DevOps initiative at Nike. And you know, when we talk about like you know asking developers to be put on page rotation, just like ops people, and when we uh, you know, have them on 2 a.m. Um, outage calls, and you know, I, I think that sort of mobilizes a generation of developers to say, I have no interest in this thing called DevOps. I will personally try to sabotage every DevOps initiative that I see. But, uh, you know, Tim said something uh, uh, startling to me. He said, the most satisfying point as a career developer myself is that when I got to write the code, when I got to test it myself, when I got to push into production myself, uh, when I got to see the happy face of customers when the stuff I wrote worked, and when I could see their angry shaking fists when it didn't work, and when I could fix it myself, right? I didn't have to, you know, open up a ticket and wait a day for someone else to do it. Uh, you know, he would say, I could not only could I have done it faster, but I could have actually learned something so that I could prevent it from happening again in the future. And, and so, having come from the service management and ITIL community myself, and, uh, you know, being uh, I was a certified IS auditor in my prior role at Tripwire, where I was CTO and founder for 13 years, you know, I, I think I have, uh, I'm somewhat complicit in, you know, creating those processes that have prevented developers from self-testing, self-deploying, and, you know, God forbid, self, you know, fixing. Um, and yet, I think that has taken so much of the joy out of development work over the last 10 years. And very paradoxically, it's being put on page rotation and uh, seeing feedback of their work all the time that actually can bring that joy back. So with the right shared goals, uh, it actually not only increases developer joy, but actually helps you know improve the lives of ops and the organization that we serve. Um, 
So uh, that is surprise number uh, two. So let's go to surprise number three. Um, uh, and uh, by the way, Chris, Rebecca, feel free to <laughs> uh, chime in with any questions uh, uh, or comments or uh, objections or concerns. Um, <laughs> or, uh, we'll we've we've got comments about the uh, the the, the angry shaking fist, but I didn't I didn't feel like it was uh, it was uh, <laughs> pertinent to an interrupt for. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, well you yeah, know, so the first uh, yeah surprise number three um, is. <laughs> um, this is measure that looks very tactical, but I think it's one of the most strategic uh, measurements of any technology organization, uh, and that's code deployment lead time. So on the next slide, in the DevOps community, there's no doubt that one of our favorite metrics is deploys per day. So we know that you know John Allspaugh and uh, Paul Hammond were at Flickr in 2009. We're doing 10 deploys a day, and you know Amazon uh, back in 2011 was doing 15,000 deploys per day. And you know these days, Ken Exner uh, shared that you know at Amazon these days, inside of Amazon Engineering, they're doing 136,000 deploys per day. So yeah, anyway, yeah, we love talking about deploys per day. But the far better measure, <coughs> and and manufacturing, they would say, uh, as the next slide is, is uh, lead time. So in manufacturing, they would measure lead time by uh, it, as specifically as how quickly can we go from a customer order and raw materials at one end of a manufacturing plant to finished goods at the other. And would you believe that in the manufacturing community, there is a deeply held belief that goes back almost 30, 40, actually not like, well, like 50, 60 years, that says lead time is the most accurate predictor of internal quality, external customer satisfaction, and even employee happiness. And so, you know, uh, we actually found in our benchmarking is that you know lead time, or specifically code deployment lead time, has the same sort of incredible predictors in the technology value stream as well. So, uh, on the next slide, uh, was I smart enough to? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, specifically, we measure lead time in our research as the lead time clock stops lead time clock starts at you know uh, when a change is introduced into version control and then you know in version control then we go through some sort of test process or uh, and then some, some sort of deployment process so it's running in production and how quickly we can go through that process uh, is the, one of the top predictors of uh, both testing and operations performance as well as design and development um, you know, in fact, so so what is so magical about that sort of change committed into version control time, that point in time represents the, the dividing line between two qualitatively different parts of the value stream. So after testing, well, let's, let's go with before. So before a change is introduced into version control, that's design and development. And so the characteristics of design and development work is that often we're doing work for the first time. It may never again be repeated. And so you know, often in infrastructure engineering, right, uh, it might be the first time we've actually set up a certain set of topology, first time that we've actually used a certain platform. So we just don't know, uh, you know how long it's going to take. Um, and that's the nature of these kind of project-oriented work, right, because we, uh, you know, it's highly creative, highly experimental. So the variance curves of that lead time is very... Um, uh, wide and shallow, right? Uh, whereas everything to the right of a change being put into version control is testing and operation. So we want that to happen very mechanistically, quickly. Uh, you know, we want it to happen the same way every time, and we want to be doing it all the time. And so the various curves there are very tall and narrow. And and so the um, what's so magical about this point of changes being interested in version control is that that lead time to running in production, that predicts the effectiveness of testing and operations, as well as predicting how quickly can we give feedback to developers. In other words, if I'm a developer and I make an error and I check it in, uh, if I only find out about it nine months later during integration testing, then when that problem blows up, the link between cause and effect has been lost. We've got to sift through the haystack for the needle. We don't know whose needle it is. Right. Um, ideally, we want that error to be caught, you know, within minutes or worst case hours after it's checked in. Right. And so that's what we, you know, that's when we have automated testing, test-driven development, and so forth. So, 
So my point here is that code deployment lead time doesn't predict just how quickly you can deploy. It actually predicts how quickly developers get feedback on their work. Um, and if we talk about in a world of iterating quickly, when we want fast feedback, right? That is probably one of the most strategic capabilities we can give, you know, to everyone in the technology value stream. So, uh, for your amusement, uh, next slide. There's actually one question that predicts. Uh, lead time and all the technical practices that matter, right? Version control, automated testing, automated deployments, proactive monitoring in the production environment, culture, uh, architectural, um, uh, the you know how loosely coupled our architecture is. Uh, you can ask predict all of that with one question, which is on the next slide, which is to on a scale of one to seven, to what degree do we fear doing deployments? Uh, one is we have no fear at all. That's why we do it all the time. And seven is we have such existential fear of doing deployments that we do don't do it ever, <laughs> right? And uh, so uh, it's just uh, isn't that interesting? So yeah. um, maybe there's one last point I want to share, uh, which I just think is sort of marvelous. Is uh, there's actually a close other predictor of performance at the top predictor performance of IT performance or org performance was whether ops is using version control. So, um, in fact, uh, in fact, whether ops was using version control predicted performance more than whether dev was using version control. <laughs> so, by the way, can we just pause it for a moment? Like, can, can we just, I'd love to, my smart colleagues here, uh, Chris and Rebecca, can, can, can you speculate on like why is it that ops using version control is such a higher, so it has such a high predictor performance? Um, I, I would I would have to say that um, if, if they have version control in ops, then then version control is a is a is a system wide accepted practice. Um, which which I would consider to be a good thing, i.e., both both dev and ops are are running from the same playbook of version control. Yeah, single source of truth that spans the entire technology value stream. I love that. Right. Uh, any other hypotheses? Fits you. Oh, I'm not as eloquent as Chris. <laughs> 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 I bring the levity. He brings the uh -huh. intelligence. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my favorite theories is that like where are there more configurable settings in the code or in the environment? <laughs> so uh, I think most ops people would say in the environment, right? It's like uh, there's so many more things that can go wrong, right? There are actually you know uh, you know things that can be configured at every level of the application stack, etc. So if that's where the entropy is, then that's actually what blocks most version control. And then you also get you know rollback and uh, you know full documentation of changes. Anyway, I just I love. I love, love, love that finding. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, I promised. Uh, uh, okay, just uh, two more quick things. Next slide. Um, no, you're doing great. You're doing fantastic. This is great. Uh, the next uh, surprise was, you know, DevOps is probably a subset of something bigger. Uh, I think researchers will would call it a uh, has all the properties of what they would call dynamic learning organizations. And so, uh, you know, the the most famous examples on the next slide. Um, is, uh, is, is it's probably the Toyota production system, and uh, Dr. Steven Spear, um, as part of his Harvard, as part of his PhD dissertation at the Harvard Business School, um, he actually worked on the assembly line of a Toyota uh, Tier One supplier for six months. Uh, he wrote this amazing book called The High Velocity Edge, and uh, when I took his workshop at MIT, I, that probably in and of itself slipped the book. By about a year, <laughs> it was just such an eye opener, and you know. So, uh, yeah, I think other examples of dynamic learning organizations are Toyota and its suppliers. It's the engine design team at Pratt and Whitney. It's the safety culture at Alcoa. Uh, there's so many examples um, that I think very much have analogs, um, you know, to what we see in DevOps. And so, it's very delightful to me to have learned this, just because in the Phoenix project, you know, I think one of the goals was to create that isomorphic mapping between the plant floor and technology work, and you know, to have been able to study this area more deeply and, and learn so much was just a, a incredibly gratifying. The other book um, that's uh, famous in the space is on the next slide. It's um, 
uh, written by Mike Rother, uh, who wrote a book called Toyota Kata. And it's just uh, these two books, you know, for anyone who nerds out on this stuff, uh, I, I think if you like the Phoenix Project and want to learn more about you know, where those principles came from, uh, th these are the two books I would recommend. Um, and the last thing I want to share with you is uh, you know, the last learning, which is that DevOps is not just for the unicorns, but you know, also for the horses as well. So uh, the next slide really shows, um, you know, really shows that this area has been my area of passion for the last three years. Really try to understand what does DevOps look like um, in not the unicorns, which is Google, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, Etsy, so forth. Uh, but yeah, you know, what does it look like in horses? Large, complex organizations you know, that have been around for decades or centuries, the largest brands in almost every industry vertical. How are they mobilizing against DevOps, and how are they replicating the same technical outcomes and amazing organizational outcomes that we have typically only seen in uh, the unicorns? Um, and uh, let me just take a quick peek here. Uh, so. Yeah, the, just to sum that up, uh, there is no doubt in mind uh, after three years of doing the DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, that yeah, there is no doubt that uh, the horses are achieving the same sort of amazing outcomes that the unicorns are. And you know, it's in my mind, you know, this is where the economic value will be created. In other words, you know, IDC, uh, the analyst firm, says there's about eight million developers on the planet, eight million ops people on the planet. Most of those are not at the unicorns. Almost all of them are in the horses. And so I think the mission at hand is how do we elevate you know, the productivity of every one of those engineers so that they're as productive as if they were working at a Google, Amazon, Netflix. And so you know, if we do that, there's no doubt that that will create trillions of dollars of economic value per year. So uh, I think that really is the mission at hand is you know, really uh, uh, you know, elevating everyone's productivity uh, so that, you know, Everyone in the value stream can be productive, um, and also as evidenced by Nathan Shimmick and uh, Tim Tischler, right? More productive, more joyful, uh, working more humane, and so forth. So that's why I think the work is so important. Um, so to sum up, uh, next slide. Uh, what do I think is important? Uh, left unchecked without something like DevOps leads to horrendous outcomes. So word cloud. How sixty percent, eighty percent of the uh, people cited um, in the four hundred nine footnotes. 509 footnotes, uh, came from horses, not unicorns. So uh, this is important because you know, the mission at hand is important. Left unchecked without something like DevOps leads to horrendous outcomes, not just for ops, but security, development, architecture, product owners, but ultimately you know, the organization that we serve. So uh, my, my very last slide um, is um, next, next. Is uh, want to learn more? So okay. DevOps Handbook is here, um, and so if you want a uh, free 140-page excerpt of the DevOps Handbook, want a free 140-page excerpt of the Phoenix Project, if you want video links to the videos and slides to all of the talks at DevOps Enterprise 2014 to 2016, and a whole bunch of other stuff, just send an email to uh, realgenekim@sendyourslides.com with subject line DevOps, and if you do that, you'll get an automated response within a minute or two. So with that, that is a uh, I guess my top learnings, Chris and uh, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Well, th thanks very much. Um, so uh, re real quick, some some of the live questions that we had. Um, the uh, Matthew asked if that particular finding about the 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 um, the ops version control or the, the the biggest predictor being the ops version control was that shown in a particular case study or in an article that you've written? Uh, yeah, actually, it's in the uh, DevOps. Handbook specifically. I, I mean, it oh, came out in the benchmarking. Uh, so, in, in like, uh, so that's a cross population, um, cross population study. So, I think that came out in the first year. So, that was like six thousand or eight thousand respondents. Uh, so, cross population studies are kind of what you uh, are. Is it what you do when you use do you survey or study a whole bunch of people, um, and then you try to find the correlation between practices and outcomes. Uh, but you know. Uh, but the other way is actually by studying kind of case studies, as, as you mentioned, right? I mean, right. the goal of science is, as one of my mentors told me, Dr. Uh, Tom Longstaff at Carnegie Mellon, he said, the goal of science is to explain the most amount of observable phenomena with the fewest number of principles, confirm deeply held intuitions and reveal surprising insights. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, when version control, it just makes so much sense to me, right? Is that, uh, yeah, we need ops 
inversion control with everybody else, right? We would need a single source of truth. Uh, we needed to keep our environments synchronized. We need to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, we can recreate states in a deterministic and predictable way. Uh, there is actually a really great case study specifically about version control um, uh, in uh, DevOps handbook. It's about a, uh, it was a large electronic data warehousing program in the middle of like an agile transformation. And, you know, they're going to year two of it. And, you know, finally, uh, you know, they uh, said, all right, <laughs> they asked the people actually doing the work, what is the main thing we need to focus on to actually, you know, improve outcomes, right? And it wasn't, you know, the biggest complaint at the time was like, you know, the business the engagement from the business people. The real thing that came out was how we need to reduce the lead times to get environments, right? Um, and they found that, you know, the biggest problem was that, you know, changes were being made, you know, in the lower environments, they weren't being propagated downstream, and so, uh, whenever it got to production, it would blow up, <laughs> just like in the Phoenix project. Um, and you know, so the the countermeasure was, you know, putting in everything into version control, getting everything trued up, uh, making sure that every time we deploy, we're pulling from version control, not in a directory. Um, and you know, suddenly we're using the same practices and philosophies as development, which you know, I think, uh, uh, which is also I think pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Sorry for rambling. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> so we have another question for you uh, that came from the live feed uh, from Taylor. It's, uh, some say that Google's implementation of site reliability engineering teams isn't DevOps, but something much different. Do you think SRE teams are a version of DevOps, and do you see the horses ever adopting an SRE framework? Yeah, I think... Um yeah, well, one I have to say first off, I'm a I'm a huge fan of Google and uh, you know the entire kind of SRE vision that was painted by Ben Trainer, uh, the VP of SRE for many many years, um, and uh, I, I think one of the uh, if I guys sort of take it from a different angle, and one of the things that I learned in this process was how many ways there are to get these DevOps outcomes. There are so many ways to uh, let's not skin the cat. There are so many ways to. Uh, it's going to be a more humane metaphor than that. <laughs> yeah, there's so many ways. To, there's so many ways to uh, help. Uh, yeah, there's so many different paths, right? Uh, so you know, I think the ones that get the most kind of notoriety are the kind of you build it, you run it, and that's the Amazon model. That's the Netflix model. Um, um, and that's where you really kind of put the ops responsibilities into the feature teams and everybody, you know, those teams have feature development and service level responsibilities. But, you know, equally valid, right, uh, but far less public and far less publicized, um, you know, is the centralized operations model, right? That's Facebook, that's Google, that's Etsy. And, uh, yeah, I think Google is very interesting. Um, uh, how many... I think there are 1,300 SREs. That doesn't sound right. Uh, I used to have this in the top of my head all the time. Uh, all, uh, you know, they have thousands of SREs, and all the SREs report into Ben Trainer, the VP of SREs, right? So he's got directors and senior managers and managers underneath him. But uh, um, the reason they do that is to preserve uh, and be able to provide some guarantee about quality, right? And so the whole idea is that uh, they have this one hiring pipeline. Uh, they hold each other accountable for the quality of the people. They rotate within teams. They get embedded into the product team. So that might be search or, you know, uh, photos or Google Plus or um, Gmail. Um, and, you know, they can actually move between those product areas. Um, and I, I think that's just great because I think Dr. Steven Spear from MIT would say, you know, one of the key characteristics of high performers is that local discoveries, there's some mechanism to turn those into global improvements, right? There has to be some mechanism, you know, to elevate the state of the practice across the entire organization. And one of the great ways to do that is by having a centralized team, right, where all the ops people, you know, hang out with each other. One can even joke that, you know, an ops person will probably never learn what they need to learn just by hanging, just by hanging out with developers, right? They have to, they learn from other ops people. So one way you do that is by having this kind of matrix organization uh, where you keep 
kind of uh, those talent pools centralized. It's very much like the Spotify model, uh, you know, the guild and um, um, uh, sorry, late in the day. <laughs> yeah, they have the, the guilds and the the community of practice uh, uh, is a specific term for that. Anyway, so that's uh, so long answer to the question. Uh, you know, is the SRV consistent with DevOps? Absolutely. There, it's just one of the many models um, that uh, we can use to get DevOps outcomes, and it is as valid as you know having the ability to run teams. So uh, we we have Hi, we Taylor, have one from. By the way. Uh, I'm sorry. Say again. Uh, hi, Taylor. <laughs> uh, we we have one from Fabs actually. Uh, he's he's asking for a a um, dictionary definition of DevOps. Do you, do you have something that we can actually put on the site? Because every everybody seems to have a different definition for it. Yeah, well, we have one. In fact, I'll even post a, a screenshot to Twitter. Um, <laughs> awesome. But, uh, <laughs> There's a, I'm trying to find where it is. It's got to be in the first couple of pages, right? Um, you know, it, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's about a paragraph. Um, okay. uh, let, let me see if I can just recite it. DevOps are the set of three, uh, it's really made up of three things, right? It's architecture, technical practices, and cultural norms that enable the fast flow of work from dev, you know, through test and operations to the customer while preserving world-class reliability, security, and stability, right? So I've just talked about outcomes, um, you know, and for sure the three kind of orthogonal components, you know, you need a loosely coupled architecture, you need the right technical practices like version control, automated testing, uh, and so forth. Uh, you need the right cultural norms, you know, for example, shared trust, high trust culture, you know, organizational learning. Um, but it's also, I think, one other element, which is uh, it also DevOps enables small teams to independently develop, test, and deploy value to customers without having to involve hundreds or even thousands of other people. Right? That notion of uh, increasing developer productivity comes from the, that kind of uh, independence um, to independently develop value without having to open up 20 tickets. <laughs> right? right. Um, oh, and plus one for the security person. Right, that's 21 tickets. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, one more. Right, uh, you know, right. to the storage people, that's 22. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, how do you? That's really partially enabled by self-service platforms, um, you know, automation and so forth. So, I, I think you know, though that two paragraphs really uh, yeah. is you know encapsulates what we believe uh, is how we define DevOps in the DevOps handbook. Definitely. So we, we also have, um, we, we have a couple of dev people in the audience, but we also have a lot of ops people in the audience. Um, and I'm sure you get this all the time, but uh, just, just so that we, we have this on record as well. What is, what is the good path to, to what, is, what is the good first step to, to, for an ops person that wants to transition into the DevOps role? You know, I, uh... Or, or, or uh, conversely, a dev person that wants to tr translate into a dev ops. <laughs> Uh, let's do that one first. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, one of my favorite stories um, that uh, went into the research of the book was uh, it was Facebook 2008. And they had this rule that said that uh, in the ops group, right, that you know, in a meeting you can't have your laptop open unless you're dealing with like a, a live site issue. Right? And then there was this point in 2008 where there were 15 people in the meeting and no one could close their laptop <laughs> because there were like 15 – Independent fires going on, right? And uh, so uh, that was like a very dark moment, and that's when they decided, you know, we're going to put developers, dev managers, architects, all on page rotation, just like ops, right? Because you know, the, I think the uh, the notion was like they have to, we have to, uh, developers must have to see the downstream effects of, of you know decisions they make, and yeah, you know, that was probably one of the pivotal turning points um, in, in the Facebook journey. Um, so that, that's kind of easy. Um, the, you know, I, I think the ops one, and, and this is a kind of a, a truly privileged audience, right? This is the V brown bag audience. This is like the the, the people who are leading uh, their respective communities, or probably led their communities into virtualization and automation and so forth. But and I, I think so. That's probably the top five percent of ops people in terms of like, um, you know, in terms of skill level. You know, the the. I guess the thing I think about all the time is like, okay, how do we kind of up-level the 95%, right? How do we 
uh, how do you make sure that you know no one's left behind, right? Because life is just getting fun now, right? In ops, like even more fun than ever. And so, you know, I guess the advice I would give is, you know, to someone who, uh, uh, you know, aren't fortunate enough to have a, a VCDX certification, um, you know, is like shadow one who is. <laughs> and if if I were uh, if I were in those shoes, the advice I would give to myself is go find the smartest person you know who has like uh, uh, the skills that you may or may not want, and just ask to follow them around for a day. And in fact, I would do that five times, right? Because it might turn out that like Chris looks kind of interesting, but is actually like the stuff he does is really, really boring. And, I'm very like, Rebecca boring. turns Absolutely. out to be. <laughs> I turned out what Rebecca <laughs> made, like totally awesome. Uh, you know, it's like he does not know. Uh, and what's great about like shadowing is that there's no commitment, right? It's like it, um, uh, it's like you if you hate it. You don't, there's only you know seven more hours to go, right? Uh, chances are, you know, you may find something that uh, really sparks an area of passion in you, right? And you know, then you know the next steps become more obvious. It's like, all right, where do I learn that skill? Or uh, who are the teams who are looking for smart people who are uh, looking for help, right? Um, I, I think that's kind of the that would be the advice I would give. I mean, what do you think of that? I mean, would you, if someone asked you, um, uh, can I just follow you around for a day? Yeah, I, I think it would be flattering. <laughs> I, I like I like to help helping people learn stuff too. Anyway, so I I definitely give that a shot. Yeah. What you said no when I asked? What? No, I didn't. That's a, that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, and what's so cool is that I mean I think kind of as adult learners, you know, shadowing is probably one of the most effective and quickest ways to learn, right? It's sort of like pair programming, right? It's like when you have a. Um, yeah, right. And so the next, the next step would be, you know, uh, just offering to like do a work session with one of those people that you admire, and, and just, I mean, I think it's the fastest way to learn. Hmm. Fitz, you can I follow you around? <laughs> <laughs> Only if I can follow you around. <laughs> oh. Okay. Cool. So um, next question. Um, uh, what, what is what is the what is next after a company has done the? Oh, here. what is what is next after a company has done the DevOps transition? That's weird. Oh, mm. hold on, I, I accidentally <laughs> launched my remote manager. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I think I, you know in the DevOps Enterprise Summit, um, one of the things I, I love the most about it is you know we have the same we have certain speakers come and talk to us year over year. So you know uh, Heather Mickman at Target. Um, uh, Topa Bradapal from Capital One, Jason Cox from Disney, um, Terry Potts from Raytheon. You know, they're all uh, uh, Carmen Diardo from Nationwide. I mean, uh, we had right, six or seven speakers that uh, you know they've talked for three years in a row. And it, to me, it feels like doing a documentary, right? You're getting you're getting to follow people around, and you know, you know, you're seeing how they get, in many cases, elevated in responsibility in terms of uh, getting promoted being asked to be, do more things uh, and you know telling the story of like their impact that they're making to their organization and I, I just love that so I mean to, to I think there's really two things that happen one is you know it really reinforces the adage you know the best are always getting better right the best in any industry right they're accelerating away from the herd just like Toyota did to everybody else in the marketplace right I mean I think uh, there are years where Toyota makes more profit than the rest of the industry combined um, you know, and I, I, w I would predict that we're going to see that in every industry vertical, whether it's banking, insurance, retailing, and so forth. Uh, and you know, it's I don't th uh, I think uh, you know it's not just the Airbnbs and Ubers and Amazon of the world, right? I mean, you know, you it's like a sleeping giant, right? When you ha when you can mobilize organizations that have thousands of engineers, right? It's a, it's a, it becomes an innovation and uh, learning game, right? You know, the organization that can learn the fastest uh, will win in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's certainly one thing. I think you see people who are driving DevOps transformations uh, getting promoted. Uh, I think nearly a third of the people who have presented at DevOps Enterprise Summit have been promoted uh, at least once, some more than once over three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and often they're being put in a role where uh, they're being asked to help elevate the state of the practice for everybody in the organization. That's you know, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of engineers. Um, so uh, yeah, 
Uh, so I, I, I don't think any of them would say they're done, <laughs> right? It's, uh, they get asked to tackle even bigger problems. Yeah, it's a continuous iteration. Cool, nice. Okay, um, uh, real quick, is is there a, a list, well, obviously the Phoenix Project, obviously the DevOps Handbook, is, is there anything else that you would add to a list of recommended reading material for somebody um, getting, in, getting into the DevOps mindset, or that wants to get in the DevOps mindset? Yes, in fact, um, uh, let me, I just posted a GitHub repo with all 509 citations. Um, uh, and let me just post it for you right here. In fact, uh, wait, let me uh, just reply to this. Uh, v brown bag, sorry, I'm <laughs> just typing here. Uh, all the citations and notes for DevOps handbook. Uh, I was about to say, here's the link, but uh, I, don't, I don't have to give you a link in the chat and then open up a ticket and then ask you to do it. No, I'll do it myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, saves everybody time and reduces lead time. Uh, yeah, in fact, I even did a blog post on that. Uh, let me see if I can... Uh, so uh, I, I don't suggest you read all of it, but I mean, you can sort of see if, if you want kind of the broadest survey of um, uh, kind of the, the surface area of kind of what we think DevOps is and, you know, case studies and so forth, um, you know, uh, this is uh, all of the fact checked. Um, is it the uh, DevOps handbook endnotes in GitHub? Yes. All right. I'll Hopefully that's what that. I posted. I'll throw that up over here. There we go. Yeah. Is this right here? Oh yeah. Yes, exactly. Oh, that's right. You're <laughs> the video. <I'm> presenting. <laughs> right. Cool. Ah, All right. Um. And uh, oh, <laughs> how do you tactfully tell your boss that he really, really needs to read the Phoenix Project? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, would, that? I, I kid, Yeah. I, I kid you not. Um. Uh, the probably the most effective um, way to do it is, uh, I just put a blog post up as well, and I've kind of, uh, I did that word cloud around it, um, uh, is, you know, this actually was t told to me by my friend John Willis, also a DevOps Sample co-author, uh, Bacho Galupa on uh, Twitter. He said, books have this kind of interesting signaling um, mechanism. So you know, if your boss really needs to read it, then give the book to every one of uh, his or her peers or maybe his or her boss mm -hmm. and just make sure that you know, um, the book is on the desks of you know, the people on his team or her team. Uh, because I, it, it's um, peer pressure. Nice. I like it. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of establishing a social norm. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's funny just maybe to wax philosophical. Uh, you know, books are Still, probably one of the best, most viral mechanisms, you know, uh, for communicating ideas. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, I think books have, still have a very special place. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, you were asking about uh, who Brent is really modeled on. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> is 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 well. The, the the question was, are there, are any of the characters from the Phoenix Project real, um, and and can we hire Brent? Is he a real person? <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. So you can imagine, right? All of the characters are sort of um, composites of people yeah. that we've all run into in our journey, um, and all of their names have been changed uh, to protect the innocent. Uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> in any ways, the information security person, John, uh, yeah. is probably based on. <laughs> right, you know, based, I'm sorry, based on who? Me. No way. <laughs> the, the shrill, hysterical person who's focused on minutia that's been marginalized by the organization. Uh, that has a breakdown and then comes back looking like a fashion model? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a friend you know, did ask, like, you know, uh, like, gee, I can't believe you would humiliate the InfoSec profession like you did. You know, like it or not, that's where you came from. Don't forget where you came from. Uh, and uh, I was like, no, 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 no. It's like, I actually, of all the characters, I, I probably understood that character the most, right? I mean, uh, That's awesome. So the one I actually have the most amount of compassion for. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but Brent was actually based on um, a colleague of Kevin Baer, a co-author, and his name was actually Brent. Um, 
you know, I just remember uh, the story where, you know, Brent got to go on vacation for the first time, and he almost cried, right? You know, he mm. hadn't been uh, on vacation without being on pager duty for, you know, three years, four years, five years. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's now, he was working for the CISO at Semantic, and, uh, yeah, he's up in Seattle now, so uh, he's a real person. Brent Schultz. That's awesome. Brent Schultz, nice. Uh -huh. um, well, I, I know that you said you had a hard stop, so I, I want to be uh, uh, respectful of your time. Oh yeah, well, hey, uh, Chris, Rebecca, thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of uh, the show and joining all the illustrious people that uh, you've had on before me. So uh, Are you thank you so much. Me? Thank you. This was fantastic, man. Uh, yeah, no. This, the, Brent, uh, the, Gene, this was this was um, this was very killer. Thank thank you very much for for joining us. Uh, no, likewise, and hey, I look forward to uh, seeing you both uh, again in person soon, and uh, hopefully the next time we'll actually involve like uh, uh, a beer or alcohol if you're choosing. We will, we will definitely have to. There's if if we meet up in Barcelona, uh, Fitzhugh and I will take you to a place that makes the best blackberry mojitos on the planet. <laughs> don't, forget the, don't forget the kiwi drink. Oh, and the, and the kiwi and the sake kiwi drinks. Yes. Oh, they were so delicious. Uh, Rebecca, you're you're based on the East Coast, right? I am. Is sort of everywhere. I, I live in Los Angeles, though. So. Oh, you are. Yeah. Um, all right. And uh, Chris, I'm on, I'm on the East Coast. I'm up in Boston. Boston. Okay. Very good. Well, I'll tell you, we will try to engineer uh, a meetup soon. So again, thanks a bunch. And uh, hey, looking forward to the next show. Definitely. Th thanks right. very much, everybody. Uh, Gene Kim, um, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.